There's the recording in progress. That's what the voice just told me. I would like to welcome my new guest, Timothy Gager. He's an amazing author of over 18 novels. His latest one's called The Best of Timothy Gager, in which it's a compilation of all of his prior work, plus 175 pages of his new work, because he is magical. He's a Celtics fan. I don't hold that against them. Welcome. Hey, Tim. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's going so good. I love how loose Tim is today. It's good. By the way, just so that you know, if you zoom away from this or you click away from this, you're going to miss the best of Tim Gager on The Art of Being Dark. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Fantastic. I don't want to miss it. <laughs> I don't want to miss it. I'm going to stay right here and watch the whole thing. Yeah, it's right. nice. We're ready. We're ready to roll. We're ready to go Boston. You got to like the top 10 in poetry on Amazon, I saw. Are you number one? Number one release, and uh, which is awesome. And uh, you know, you got to catch it early. So I, I think I'm still in the top twenty or twenty five. But you catch it early. You get, you know, you get your followers, you get your readers to buy the book right away. You know, it's just, you know, it's all planned. You got a bum it's all rush. Amra yeah, you got a bum rush. Amazon. You go. I'm a bestseller. I'm a bestseller. Mm -hmm. Hey, pull the truck back over here. Hey. <laughs> How many millions of dollars have you made as an author? Uh, zero million. Zero million. I can count, you know, I'd like to just, I'd like to count it in $10 bills instead. Okay, that'll work. Yeah. It's hard to make any money as an author, to tell I, you the truth. That, well, no, that is, that's the dirty little secret. Everybody thinks, oh, you made a book, you're a millionaire. Well, you never make money, really off your book you know there's there are a few like outlier authors that everybody looks at like i don't know stephen king danielle Steele, right whatever they they have a brand and they have a like a system and they just pump it out right and they have and you know those are the publishers the publishers rally around those guys that are going to make them money which is you can't blame them you know they're going to make make them some money but uh you know that and that's part of their script as well. But I mean, I love TV and movies when they have the author character and, and he's just, you know, he's just writing in the, even in the series, he's writing a bunch of crap. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's all glamorized to make it seem like it's something it's not, but the magic of Hollywood. True. The truth. Yeah. True. Truly the magic of Hollywood. Yeah. No, you have to, you know, it's, it's, even if you get um even if you get a publisher i was just talking about with my wife she wants to get a publisher for her second book which she probably will you know she did well with her first book but you know they give you an advance right up front if you're lucky and what you don't realize most people with most off most authors don't realize and certainly people who think about you know who aren't in the business of this at all is that advance is against any book sales and you very well, if you don't sell enough books, you're gonna have to dish, you know, give money back to them. What's what's the next step? Money back with interest? That would be the next step. It'd be like a credit card, credit card company. Oh, and the other thing, it, I mean, basically it'll go there. It can go there. The trend is, besides the one I just named, I'm surprised that no one thought of it. The trend is less and less advances, advances get smaller and smaller, especially for middle authors, or they're, they're none at all. And the other part of it was is gaining self-control over your work. But when you do that, there's, there's a lot of payment. People are more than willing to pay for any piece of the publishing process. And that was never the case even 20 years ago. True, true. Do you ever consider doing, well, I mean, you've got a publisher, so you're, you're, in, you're in good shape. Um, are you going to set up a... a, a a business model, like a, a, a speaking business model, where you can start to capitalize on all the books you've written and, and start to maybe doing some speaking engagements. Um, I know you do poetry readings. I know you've done that. And I know you've done readings. Uh, by the way, for those of you keeping score in Tim's world, this is the genius that did not know how to operate Instagram to record <laughs> Tim who had flown 3,000 miles across the country to Los Angeles to read his latest book, Joe the Salamander, well, the prior book, Joe the Salamander Out Loud. 
So anyone who needs any IG video shot, I'm your guy. Tim, can I, I figured, you know, I figured Dar's in the movie business at some level, obviously. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it cost me a good 10 or 15 books, Dar kind of fumbling around with Instagram. So listen, you, you can't pay for that kind of uh, testimonial. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, but uh, uh, have you thought about that? Do you, do you want to, is that something like that appealing to you? It is appealing to me. I mean, my hands are like uh, really tied up because you can only do so much. Either you're writing or you're promoting or you're branching into new stuff. I mean, I'm currently branching into screenwriting and, uh, you know, there's only so much time to do that. Also, people, I'm doing developmental editing. I'm doing all kinds of stuff. But, you know, uh, of course, there has to be a uh, there has to be a. Uh, a need or a want to have me appear. So like, I'm still working, I'm still working on being wanted. <laughs> the biggest obstacle uh, uh, is that nobody wants me. That's the largest <laughs> obstacle that there is. Well, they don't know that they want you. That's, and you have to, that's, see, this is all, this all ties back. This sounds just like we're talking all over the place, but this all kind of ties back into being able to sell your book. You, you have to, you know, the author is the marketer of the book. And even if you get a deal with a publisher, I don't know what it was like for you. I remember watching my wife do it and several of my friends and a couple of, I don't know, call them colleagues, associates, whatever. Um, if you're lucky, your publisher will have a, a book launch party. Maybe two, like my wife got really lucky. She had two, maybe three book launch parties. And then after that, it was like, you're on your own, man. Good luck. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's, and and you got to have like an email list. You've got to have a mailing list. You have to have a strategy of how your book's going to get sold. And the same thing happens with the speaking. You know, you're just like, well, what do I do? Jesus, I don't know. And it's stacked against, especially it's stacked against small publishers that, you know, the, the cost of printing just went up tremendously like uh, a month or so ago. The mailing, even media, media mail has gone up from like a couple bucks to like five dollars for one book so it's it's like you know the small press publisher wants to compete um mm -hmm. they're raising prices of the books it's a, that's a hard model to to sustain so printing has gone up in the last month yep cost of paper cost of printer whatever whatever it is no kidding it, okay yeah. you know i was i i wrote a small like i, I want to i think it's like like a 25 page book um because i wanted to have something that i could you know sell and kind of use as a calling card i'm starting to my speaking uh, business right and I, I landed two gigs so far um with more to come uh but you know so i'm doing all this as we're talking about it and people are like oh well you know you work in hollywood it has no bearing on anything if it does it's it's kind of ancillary, you know, it's kind of like, oh, and he, you know, he, he's an actor, he's, uh, and he produced stuff. But um, I went to look to publish a paper, uh, you know, hard copy, a, a paperback of the book. And it, it was fairly expensive. I was like, what the, f I might as well just make this electronic and let that be. Because I'm just going to use it as a, as a means of uh, building up a, a, an email list. That's it, you know. Yeah, it's it's really really hard out there, but I mean it's it's as they say it's art, as they say in Boston. It's, it's art. Yeah, it's art. Well, like uh, I, I mean the the money's in other things. It's possible possibly teaching if you don't get stuck in uh, the adjunct world, and possibly like uh, you know someone wants to make your book into a series or a movie. That that's that's where it's at right now, and. Uh, you know, it's it's a hobby. I can declare it as a hobby for my taxes, and then write off all the everything else. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the so inside tax tips from Timothy Gager. You declare everything. You know the those toenail clippers that you use when you're working on the book. You can write those. Write off. those off. Yeah, because you have to have comfortable clothes when you're you know working really hard as a writer. The, the Kleenex you use to dab the tears when you can't get anybody to pay attention to your book. 
write those off. Exactly. So you don't think you don't think the speaking model that's not it's not it's too hard for you. So you're going to just write a screenplay and get into Hollywood, <laughs> which is much easier. I'm uh, like, what is he talking about? Okay. I have no. not actually. I've not really focused on the whole appearing as a speaker type of thing. It's just not my focus. Like, uh, no, I get it. Sure. I get that. Sure if I put my mind to it, I could probably do it. I could also probably do a lot of things. But uh, you know, that's not, uh, not your groove right now. I mean, well, you know, creative people can do whatever they want with whatever they can, you know, there's creative people can cook, they can do all, it's just, you know, whatever you put your mind to and focus on, it's, yeah. uh, I mean, for me, I've always been able to do that. And I've, I don't think I've gotten obsessed on any one genre or any one thing, but if I really focus on something that doesn't involve coordination or like athleticism stuff, that's like, you know, genetic types of stuff. <laughs> I mean, I might be able to shoot 60% from the foul line on the playground and get it up to like 75, that type of stuff. But, you know, my focus is like, if I focus on something and something new and I'm willing to put the work in, it's only going to get better. Okay. All right. So you are, I know who you're inspired by a certain woman and a certain man that, you know, who have had uh, some interest and maybe even some success along the path of turning their book into a television show or a movie. Yeah. I don't even know who you're talking about, but it's oh, a certain stop. woman. Stop. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> My first thought was Adam and Eve. You got to go way back. You got to go way back to Adam and Eve. And figure out like how it, yeah. Um, I have some really great mentors that are helping me out, and uh, it's it's really really great. And of course, there's no guarantees, but, but um, it's always about you know best effort. Do your best effort and see what happens. And uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are battling against against you in terms of of that. Like you can always tell, you can always tell who's in the field when like you talk to somebody. So they're like, hey, I'm writing a screenplay. People not in the field are like, what? Where, where can I watch that? What channel is it on? And if they are in the field, they're like, well, yeah, good luck. You know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely amazing. I'm not being that asshole right now, but I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah. All right. I'm realistic about it, you know, I, I really am. And it's it's all like, you know, it's all a learning experience. Just like, uh, and you never know what you get by asking, like for in the, the best of Timothy Gage. That's book, true, that's true. The, pub that's true. the publisher put it out and the publisher picked, um, picked the best, what she thought was, her name's Robin Stratton, what she thought was the best of all of my work from all of my books. And I was like, sometimes you just ask them like, Hey, do you mind if I put some new stuff in here? I got a few new stuff. And then she's like, okay. And I took a look. It was 175. I doubled, I doubled the size of the book. So I was it's, gonna it's really, ask you, that's a lot of pages, man. Okay. Got a lot okay. of girth, you know. Right. And as we discussed prior before we had the uh, technological technical issues, girth is more important than length of a book. Exactly. I like all so my, I've I like heard. So I've heard. I like all my books to be like a, you know, a soda can size. Right. It's the soda can model. It is. And that, that, that's good. It's, it's, uh, but you know, I'm a, it's, it's, it's my longest book to date, I believe. Uh Oh, um, so it's girthy, but it's also long. Okay. It, it, I think that'll be the I end mean, of our really bad jokes, but I, I yeah. cannot confirm or deny any of that. Yeah, so, so it pretty much is. I just I just grabbed the book that I thought was uh, the longest, and it's two seventy two. So um, so right. yeah, three fifty nice number. I, I you know I think that I want this book to sustain. Like I'm really kind of proud and honored and really uh, humbled by having a best of. You know, it's Dude, not, you're, it's not you so you know eighteen books. That's kind of amazing. And over the what course of time is that again? 18 books in 22 years. 20, 22 years. Yeah, 18 books in 22 years. And but I'm kind of out of I'm kind of out of books. 
<laughs> I'm out of material. My my folders on my computer are pretty much empty, but you know they they fill up fast. I'm already thinking of the next novel, which uh, has some early plot development in my head. I don't have one word to paper, but I know I can. I know what I want to write, and I I know that I can pro I can probably do it. So that's. Have you been moved to start writing yet? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm I'm in total promo phase, and it's kind of like, you know, exactly. the whole promo stuff. And God, like, I, I don't want to do TikTok or Reels. And I was told to I don't blame you. I don't blame you. It's don't blame not you. writing, and like TikTok is not real life. Do you ever no. see people like filming a TikTok? Yes. Like. Yes. It's like three hundred <laughs> takes to do a little dance. That's they listen. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Listen, God bless you, Anna, if you watch this. If she tried to convince me that I should just get out of my own way and do it. And I'm like, yeah, that's not happening. That's not happening. You know, I, I, there's a lot of uh, things I'm going to do, but I'm not going to sit around and act like a, you know, an idiot with my phone because I know the process of filming. I know the process of shooting. It's take after take after take after take after take. I'm cool with that if you pay me. But I'm not doing it on my own dime with a smartphone. You know what I mean? I'm just not doing that. And it's well, not it's, my crowd. It's not my crowd. Well, in the uh, event of trying to make it big and being a long shot, if you can get one of one of those stupid things to go viral, that's that's the goal. And I think people's goal in life now is to go viral at it's something. It's so stupid. Yeah. Look, if my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle. Sorry. Uh, but that's the truth, you know, if big I, big F, I know, I know people want to go viral. It's like, it's not about viral, man. It's not about, you know what the most viral thing you can do if we're going to use that word, which I detest, just be yourself, be yourself, have a point of view, share that point of view and be willing to uh, defend that point of view and talk about it and be wrong about it too, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. None of the none of the big writers or none of the incredibly incredibly good writers of today that might be on big publishers, none of them have to do that bullshit. Well, that's true. I mean, look, you know, like I, I'm be, I'm drawing a hard line, but that's part of having a point of view, and I'm willing to be wrong about it. But honest to God, if I'm if I'm or you or any author is Thinking that if I make a YouTube reel or a TikTok video or an Insta video or whatever, and that's going to push me over the edge, I'm going to be a bestseller. I don't know. I think you might want to rethink your uh, marketing strategy. I don't know. That just doesn't seem like uh, I don't know. If I'm looking, if you're if you're marketing to people looking at videos to read your book. And there's also it, it works in reverse, too. Publishers will look at how many followers you have at various platforms. And there's no guarantee that any of your followers is going to buy anything. That, Listen, that's, man, that, that's, that's, that's such nonsense. You're right, Tim. You're right. There's no guarantee of any of it. Any of it. I, I'll yeah. share a story with you. I'll share a story with okay. you. So I uh, had an opportunity to get represented at WMA, William Morris Agency. Okay. Or what, what do you call it? WME, William Morris Endeavor, excuse me. Huge. It's one of the big four agencies in town. And the agent uh, let me know what life was like for him. And he said, so here's my job. You know, I got put on a desk and my job is to get these Hollywood stars, kids who are influencers with big uh, social media followings, a commercial or a TV show. I was like, really? He goes, yeah. I said, how's that going? He goes, no one cares. Which <laughs> kind of warmed the cockles of my heart. Like, yeah, because that's, I mean, what are we talking about, right? What, there's a huge difference between shouting into this void and, and getting followers if they're real i'll just playing along that they're real they're not bots they're not fake yeah. accounts right because that's the name of that game on tiktok and instagram and 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 <clears throat> and um and you think that's going to translate over like we were talking before 
you know, to doing 27 takes. Like I did a job one time with a certain, I won't even divulge the gender of a, an influencer, one of the early ones with a huge number of followers on social media. And this influencer showed up to work. They, they'd gotten a, a, an opportunity that most anyone in Hollywood who's trying to be a performer, an actor, an actress would give their left arm for, right? And on take 10, when this influencer couldn't get it done, everyone's looking at themselves like, the fuck is going on? Well, they don't know what they're doing. They have no idea. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't have any kind of craft. They don't have any skill set. They don't have any tool bag, so to speak, to reach into. So anyway. Um, did, you ever, yeah. did you watch the show Reboot? No, I did not see that. Re uh, Reboot is... Uh... I don't know, we're allowed to give plugs to shows that we like. So really briefly, it, it takes on the whole Hollywood re reboot of old shows. So it's a satire and it's a comedy. They're, they're rebooting uh, one of those family shows and they replace one of the actresses with a social influencer. And uh, it's just a disaster. That's one of the, one of the subplots. And Johnny Knoxville stars in it and he's really good. Oh, that's where I heard it. Okay, Knoxville stars. In it. All right, I'll watch that. Yeah, that's lit. That's, you know, there's like, <laughs> all they had to do was just sit on the set that I was on one time, which happened, you know, hundreds of times in the business over the past 10 years, five years, whatever, and go, Jesus, there's, there's, there's the show. That's the show. <laughs> Reboot. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So this guy's trying to get these, these influencers gigs and he can't do it. And he said, they would die to have one of the jobs that you have. And I yeah. have, I have, a, you know, like no followers. It's I mean, in the hundreds, what, it's in the thousands, maybe. I mean, think about this in terms of uh, craft and skill. Do you know any of the, in, are, there, are there any authors or writers that are influencers because of their writing? And, and are any non, any big social influencers able to write a book? So why do you think, why c would you think that they can act? They can hold up a Pepsi, they can hold up whatever. Man, Absolutely. these, yeah, it's, yeah, I could go Absolutely. on and on. It's true. It does. I don't understand that. It's just, it's nonsense. And I've had, you know, I had casting directors before say, oh, what's your social media following? I'm like, I'm not playing that game with you. Oh no, but it's important. I go, it is not important. And, and they used to get upset when I first talk about that with them. And it, you know, very well may have cost me jobs. Fine. If that's what you're looking for, Bangu, good luck to you. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping the trend will reverse and I believe it will. Like, uh, just as like yeah, various social media platforms get less popular, I think the whole, people are just gonna get sick of the influencers. It's just a matter of time. Well, I think, it, I think, I think that process has begun. It is, it's not, it's reaching, uh, it's not reaching, it's gaining more and more kind of, it's getting more gas, more speed, more momentum, but it's happening. And it's, it's like, I mean, it, uh, what I do, what happens when, when these kind of things happen, when these types of things happen, I always try to pull back and look at the, you know, the, the airplane view, 30,000 feet down onto the, the land below. And every time in every industry, it all kind of always comes back to the basics, the fundamentals. So, so the Celtics, right? Talk, talk basketball. I used to play basketball. And uh, I got, I was very lucky and I got a chance to go to the John Wooden and separately, the Jerry West basketball camps, back to back one summer when I was a teenager. And camps. it was amazing, dude. John Wooden's camp is the one that stands out in my mind the most, even though I'm a huge Lakers fan and love Jerry West, Mr. Logo, you know, Mr. Clutch, all that stuff, right? John Wooden's camp, dude, we didn't even shoot the basketball in during camp, you know, between eight and four, which was the times we had, you know, we were in, engaged with the counselors all day. We didn't even shoot the ball until the morning of Thursday. We got there on a Sunday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning, we finally got a chance to start shooting hoops. And what we did beforehand, it was worked on the fundamentals, ball handling, dribbling between your legs, dribbling behind your back, passing. Dude, hours upon hours upon hours, up and down the court, just handling the ball around you, right? In between your legs, full length of the court, front and back. And 
that made me a better player by leaps and bounds. And I think the same thing translates to what we're talking about here, whether it be authors or actors or directors, publishers, whatever, there's always going to be the hot thing in a minute, but it always comes back to your your fundamentals and what your foundation is. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And like, it's just the whole morphing of, you know, when I was young, there was a funny TV commercial that we would talk about it. And now like, you know, we got a, a funny, dumbass people that you don't even have to talk about. You can just click on or do, do whatever you want. But I think that the tide is turning because there are, the way it's portrayed too, is not being portrayed as glamorous on television and movies. I watched a TV show that the main character, there was social influencers filming next door and the main character kind of walked over and beat the crap out of them, which is which is kind of like, you know, take that. Be still my heart. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know what? It's all about that. And it's all about like social, like uh, it's so important for like social acceptance of various things, you know, like, like, wow, you're writing a screenplay when it's going to be on. Wow, you're doing this. And like the social not acceptance, it's very subtle, but like it works like forever, forever in movies, they used to kind of put in little digs against television because like that television wasn't the proper craft. And now it's been happening for a long time and it's real, real subtle, but it's effective. And it's not necessarily all that well planned out. Yeah, <clears throat> that was the narrative. Was right. The narrative. It was always right. like, yeah, you're slumming if you went and did TV. Then I mean, that's started. changed a lot. Oh, you know? absolutely. Listen, when Dustin Hoffman did TV, I was like, okay, it's over. The old model's over. <laughs> the old model's dead. I forget the name of the show right now that was about horse, horse racing. And ultimately, as with any, well, horse racing is a dirty little sport with lots of abuse toward those horses. No one likes to hear that. But I think like two or three horses, at least one horse died during the filming of the show. And then they had to, yeah, yeah, they had to cancel it. Anyway, yes, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I know, I know, uh, 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 first of all, I go back, we're, we're all over the place, but I, I wish you good luck with the screenplay. And, and I don't know what it's going to be. If you're looking to make a movie or you mentioned that before, is that it? Or TV? A series, actually. I'm writing the pilot. And uh, the big okay. advantage is when I was growing up, my nickname used to be TV Tim because I watched a lot of freaking TV. So I have a good sense on what a show needs to do, what it looks like, um, how it should be written. It's, it's kind of like, uh, and I'm not like, not to toot my own horn, but I, I have a lot of experience watching TV <laughs> and it's helpful. It's just like when you're writing, you need that experience of reading other books. And Did you, you deconstruct always... television shows that you watched? Is that what you mean? Or is it just like it's so much TVs in you, you feel comfortable that you'll be able to create a series? Yeah. I feel comfortable that my dialogue won't be canned. I feel comfortable that each episode will have a beginning, middle, end, and a hook to the next one. You know, very basic stuff. Um, it's got to be, dialogue has to be good. The setting has to be good. Uh, you kind of know, like, like things, just by observation. Like, like in like Breaking Bad, that whole season with the swimming pool and the plane accident and how they started each episode like in the pool with various debris and whatnot. Like that is, that's genius stuff. But you pick up on all that stuff if you watch a lot of TV. You sounds like you got, I, yeah, no, you do. But it sounds like you, you're, you're looking at it from a different aspect. A di yeah, more, and, I, more, a and I also telling. don't, yeah, I, I don't want to also be like belittling any of the professionals at all because the professional screenwriters know what the fuck they're doing. I, I freely admit I don't know what the fuck I'm doing um, in that in that genre at, at the moment, but it doesn't mean that I don't believe that I can do it. And that's there's a big difference in that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation for sure. Yeah, no, I, I wish you luck on it and I think you'll probably do well, but. Uh, they're, they're so funny. The song that was in my head this morning had a, uh, an earworm. 
uh, Richard Mark Richard Marks from the '80s had a song that was a it was a minor hit. Don't mean nothing. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with it. Yeah, don't mean nothing until they sign it on the dotted line, and uh, that's really where the rubber meets the road. And even when you have something signed on the dotted line, what did you sign? Where does it go? You know, whatever, yeah. whatever, and whatever. That, I mean, at some point, if, when I'm looking. For for production money this clip will show up that says the screener doesn't know what the fuck he's doing which is you know they'll bring back the, the art of being dar they'll look it up and be like oh yeah uh, this is we're not we don't believe in this kid i don't know maybe if anyone looks at this you're now kid get the road well everybody's nobody until there's somebody and uh yeah you're right you know it's just I, i'm just thinking about i've, I've had uh, how do how much do i want to say here uh I every periodically I get reached out to online through social media. Okay. Well, online, duh, it's social media. And invariably it's some form of this conversation. I have an idea for a movie. I have an idea for a TV series. Uh, I have a script, whatever, you know, whatever phase they're in. And will you help me? <laughs> it's like, Yeah, I was I that the... guy. I was that guy before, but I don't know that I had the moxie to just like uh, reach out to someone and go, hey, listen, this is my idea. Will you give me money to make it? And I was yeah, like, that's not a very good strategy. And also, it's, it's also kind of like the emails I get like, here's my uh, 300 page novel. Will you read it and tell me what you think? Yes, exactly. It's not dissimilar to that. And I've responded, what I think is you shouldn't reach out to writers this way. That's what I think. And also it's a pay, it can be a paid service. Like the developmental editing that I'm doing is a paid service. There's various expertise that like, I've earned, just like the expertise that if you've earned, you've earned them, no one gave them to you. No one gave them away. No, no, I know it's, that's, that's what I mean when I'm saying the moxie, the the whatever you know it's just it's like jesus christ man are you do you hear yourself i've, and, and I've been of, waiting for your dm to slide in on twitter or instagram or <laughs> facebook or whatever god i've just been over here my just like, oh, were <laughs> oh my god can i please take on your project i don't know you i don't you don't even have a script yes i'll help you and i'll go raise capital yes god please because I don't have anything. And the bottom happening. line is, they're reaching out to you because one, they don't know what they're doing, or two, they don't want to fucking do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to put you know what, past someone else and they'll do it all for me, and I'll get my name on it. And like, honestly, you know what? That's really that's that's exactly what that is. When someone reaches out like we're making fun of here, that's exactly what it is. And uh, and I have to really just kind of like always be polite because you don't want it but you just kind of want to you just kind of want to answer them like harshly it's not their fault they don't know any better but like i you know, I, I beg to differ they do know better they do so better. so when they reach out to you about like i've got this great script movie you produce it do you say like hey i've got a great script for you to star in it's a porno movie when you bend over someone will shove it up your ass how's that for a movie idea i love it <laughs> When do we start? <laughs> you got money for it? I absolutely have the money for it. I'm going to make you a star. Uh, I'm in the middle of actually two different uh, two different people trying what I'm talking about right now with me, and it's just I I I've uh, I've been the nice guy about it before, and all it does is just encourage that behavior and that insanity. And so I decided, you know, I just, life's too short. I don't know how many more years I've got on planet earth. I don't know how many minutes I've got, you know, am I going to make it to the end of the day? I don't know. None of us do. Right. So I hope you do. I, I do too. I'm pulling for me. I'm on team Dar. I hope it happens. The but, prophecy today would just suck. Like how would I promote the webcast? Like who would, well, it? I mean, I'm not, there's no self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm just putting it out there. None of us know, right? And so if you take that tack, like, look, life's this precious thing and time is invaluable. There is no way to put value to time. Then why am I fucking playing games with you? You know, and I will say respectfully, at, at the risk of offending you, I'm going to speak directly with you. And then I lay it down. 
I don't know you. You're effectively asking me if you want to fuck, that you want to fuck me. Boom, let's go. Uh Uh-uh, it's not how business gets done. What are you talking about? You know, you wouldn't do that if you're trying to actually go and have sex. You would romance. There's a courtship. There's a, a relationship nurturing, right? And relationships and relationships that you build in your field, uh, in writing field, they go a long way. Word of mouth is still the most effective way to get things, earn things, do yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that, that, I mean, you know, when we were, when Tim and I were kids, they used to say all you had was your name and your reputation. I mean, that's the truth, though. Right? That's the truth. Yeah. So, you yeah, know. Now, now reputation doesn't even necessarily matter. People have bad reputations and they use it to their advantage. Sometimes, sometimes you're right. But I mean, most of the time, you know, what's he like? What's she like? You know, I was listening to an interview with uh, 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 director Edward Zwick, big director, great director. And he says, you know, I'm trying to get this movie made and they, you know, there's this star and I want to hire this star, but, you know, I've heard some things. So I'll call other directors that I know that have worked with the star and say, what am I in for? What am I looking at? What am I up against? Yeah, if it, when it comes down to a, a field that's very, very competitive, if it comes down between you and someone else, you better have that reputation that you're easy to work with. Yeah, you know, I mean, true. You know, I look, I like to have fun and I'm always professional on a set, um, joke around, but, you know, I'll get the job done and, and, and you can count on me to be there and deliver the goods. Um, well, people know, people that know Joe the Salamander, uh, you know, I, Dara and I were talking about uh, Dara playing Millie's father, who's a, a great, came from Cambridge, Mass. I asked him about his Boston fucking accent. Can he do it? Can he, can he pull it off? Cambridge, Massachusetts, how do you do it? Let me hear it, Dara. Now, think about it. Think about it first. You don't want to blow it now. This is your audition. Oh, Let, tell me my how many, God. No tell pressure. Me how many this fucking, is Hollywood. This is Hollywood right now. Tell me now. how many fucking followers you have. Three, two, one, go. Tim, listen, I got 3,000 followers, but more importantly, I got a buddy named Thor. Thor and I used to go out to the bar and we'd sit down and we'd say, yo, bartender, and they would ignore us. And I'd go, fucking, this is the god of thunder, Thor, and I'm the god of rock and roll, da. We demand service and we didn't pay you for a fucking drink after that. Yeah, I think you got the job. Thank you know, you. there's all this, there's all this awesome. around the country of police brutality. And you know what? I'm from Southie. So Southie, like we got this certain advantage of being from Southie because we were fucking white. But let me tell you, with the police harassment in Southie is like when they're directing traffic, right? The, the cops, they're directing fucking traffic. They're not giving you any signal. So you drive and they're like, they bang on you and they're like, hey, what do I say to stop you fucking? That's harassment. You know what you've got that's so authentic? When folks from, from Boston start talking, and most and from Southie, there's like you can hear the English influence still in, in the accent. You said har- har- harassment like it was British almost. You didn't say harassment, you said harassment. harassment. Well, I, you know what I love, and I get a, a big kick out of the various accents around Boston, and also the ones with Brooklyn. Brooklyn's totally different. You know, we got Brooklyn, yeah, forget about it. Brooklyn, yeah, Brooklyn sure. Was the South, fucking motherfucker. But, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of like I, I I love that. There's a lot I love about Boston and and the sections of Boston. There's a lot I dislike that Boston has sections. Like it's uh, Boston is very. I don't consider Boston a racist town anymore, but I'm speaking from my own point of view, my own perspective. You know, I'm a, I'm a you know I'm an old white dude, but I believe that you know Boston's laid out to be very segregated. It's not official segregation. Every city is, man. Every city is. Every city. And by definition, the fact that the city is segregated means that each city is racist. But that's even looking at it too too broadly. You got to pull back and go, why does this happen? How does this happen? Anyway, let's not go down that path. Socioeconomic path, yeah. yeah well, I mean, yeah. And then you get into redlining. And then you get into gerrymandering. And people are like, what? What does that mean? Yeah. Anyway, Tim. Wasn't Jerry Mandering? Pardon me? Jerry Mander, wasn't he on Leave It to Beaver? Oh, no, that's Jerry Mandering was on Leave It to Beaver. Uh, <laughs> his name was Jerry Mandering. They changed it to Jerry Mathers. Uh, and he had a brilliant career. 
Um, he tried to get into politics later and he did even better. It's like, what are they talking about? Look at I don't know. Or don't. I don't care. This is what we happened with Tim and Dar. Yeah, but, but it's off. good. You know, we it's it's good. Gager, what's the temperature where you are right now? You know what? We've been it's funny that uh middle America's freezing right now and below zero and Boston's for, 40, 45 fucking degrees. Boston. 45, 45 fucking 45 degrees. degrees. All right, what am I looking at? I'm looking at 65. It's wicked nice today. Yeah, uh, like I I haven't shoveled, I haven't even broken out the shovel this winter at all. Neither have I. Well, melted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of rain. We had a lot of rain and then it disappeared and it won't happen again. So you're thinking about writing your next book. You don't know what's going to happen. You're working on a script, which I think is uh, admirable and crazy but it's a good crazy because it's big and it's outside of your comfort zone. And that's the thing that I really like, I admire that about you to go do that. And you're pragmatic about it because you realize you've never done it before. And, 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 you know, um, I and remember I've got I, a really good mentor that reads it and like adjusts it as needed. And it's as needed a lot, a lot good. is as needed. So you know, it's down to like line per line and setting and even how to set the scene, like how to construct a screenplay. That's, the, I think for people that don't write screenplays, that's the hardest thing to do. How do you actually set it up so it looks like every other screenplay and it's workable, you know? You do Actors know. Actors can look at it and know what to do, you know, yeah. based on what you're writing. You know, it's not like writing a novel. There's no like three pages of setting the scene and describing the the wind in molly's hair and shit like that that doesn't really doesn't really uh fit in screenplays it's because yeah it's a visual medium so just shoot that image and move on <laughs> yeah it's yes. it no dude it's it's a whole thing it's tough it's not if, if i'll go online if you need any help at all with any of it uh reach out i see all kinds of writing i read all the just scads of stuff so um yeah so maybe, maybe you can help me with my peroni's disease commercial uh, Bill, sure. nervous looks down at carrot oh no i wouldn't change bent, a thing <laughs> bent carrot bent carrot yeah that's no, good no i think it's great uh i would just suggest we get bill clinton no one even knows what that is. That's a, I love that that reference. That's I'm just gonna let it be. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the two people that we know that are doing it. I remember I was talking with Anna, and Anna mentioned to me that she was gonna get her. You know, she's out still trying to get this movie made around the book, and I guess she's got action about it's it. It's close. I think there is some good action on it. Yeah, I, she she may get it made. I don't know. I mean, there's so many steps in the movie making process from, from A to Z, like to get a movie made, your first movie made usually takes about 10 years. And that's if you have a viable product that people really want to, you know what I mean? They really want to see it. It's just, and it's crazy. I used to think it was insane, but you know, I'm in the middle of that process right now. You know, my wife and I just, you know, it just takes, <clears throat> excuse me, it takes time. And you kind of take it in the shorts on your first deal. You just do. You know, but that first deal gets made and the second one makes it easier to get made. Get your emails answered, your phone calls returned, that kind of stuff. And once you get control over it and people see that you've made something, then you're getting, your phone is ringing. Well, yeah, because it's that hard to get something made. Yeah. Nobody goes and, you know, nobody wants to make a bad TV show. Nobody wants to make a bad movie. There's so many variables and it's a collaborative process. And, um, uh, so when it's a collaborative process, then, you know, that, and this goes back to what we were talking about before, you have to be able to know how to manage relationships and you have to know not only relationships, but in a creative sense, because everybody wants to put their stamp on it. Go, that's my thing. I wrote that line. Oh, I did this. I suggested that setting. I suggested this scene. Like it's, well, it's I mean, my, tricky. my uh, screenplay and my show Bible that I've created is all about handing it off. 
once I hand it off and someone agrees to do it, I've got no control. So why would I try to get control over if they want to change every single line? That's freaking fine. Just give me. Well, you're in a better headspace, man. You're in a better headspace. That's a that's a good place to be, because they're you know like so what you're doing like the screenplay you're writing the the show bible you're putting together. That's to sell. Exactly. If you realize that's to sell, and you actually do get a meeting, and you actually do sell it. The fucking heavens are singing your name, and and they're and guaranteed someone's going to come in, whoever buys it, whoever buys and they're going to want to rewrite the whole thing and everything else because that's how they, you know, pee on everything, mark their territory, and then they can say created by. And also, uh, you know, with the trends in terms of what the characters represent and who they are and what's being what's being produced and what type of characters do you need in the show yeah. certain, yeah. unless you fill those roles for example say that they, you need various um you need various um cultural representation in your show um those are the only ones that are kind of being made now so if you stick like if i'm sticking to Everyone in Joe the Salamander is blonde, white, and blue eyes. Uh, you know what? The show's not going to get made. Well, it might. Never say never. But like, exactly. you have to go with the flow. And I learned that from a John Irving's book, which is, uh, I think it's called, not my movie, Madness. But he described what it was like to have oh, yeah. all of his books made into movies. And yeah. which ones he had control over and which ones he didn't have control over. And how it really kind of doesn't matter in the long run. And, you know, like like Stephen King with, uh, you know, putting out his version of uh, it, and his version of oh he did an, he did another one that he oh uh, the Shining, because he disagreed with how Kubrick handled the Shining and he disagreed and he wanted his version. And it turned out that his version wasn't all that different. Okay. Uh, but you know, it, it's interesting that he had that need to do it. But if you're Stephen King, you can do anything. Yeah, but even Stephen King knows, right? Right. Yeah. 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 I'm a I'm a novelist. I'm a novelist. Yeah. You know, not a screenwriter. And I think that in the conversation about the book is better than the movie or the book is different than the movie is totally different today because nobody's reading the books. <laughs> they see the show, they see the show streaming, and then they might pick up the book, but it's not like might. It used to be the book was the first thing. The book came first. People read the book first and then they could see how it compared to the movie. I don't think that really reading the books, that conversation is not going on. No, 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 it's not. It's not. It's just, it's, you know, look, it's, it's separate um, business models. And, and, and I think like historically, most people never read the book. Like I never read the Godfather books. Did you? I read the first one. Yeah, it was amazing, okay. actually. It was I'm, amazing. I'm, sure, I'm sure it was. That, but that was, you know, a different time, different place. I never read the book. I just watched the movies. I, I, I haven't movie. read. I don't know. I remember reading a book. I can't remember what movie it was. It escapes me. Anyway, I'd read a book. It would turn into a movie and I watched the movie. What the fuck is this? This sucks. This isn't what happened. I know it's it's. It's it's amazing. But what but what's the conversation going to be like now? Hey, the Dunkin' Donuts commercial with the TikTok dance, the original TikTok dance was better than the TV commercial. Like, I mean, are people having that conversation? I doubt. Uh, I mean, sure, we can have any conversation we want. Ultimately, you just want to sell your damn show, right? You just want to sell your show. You just want to sell your book. And um, I don't know, man. Listen, it could happen. It could happen. You never know. You never know. And it can and it can go it can go backwards too. Uh, my favorite story about a writer that really made it and made it big was a local guy, Tom Parada, who everybody knows now. But I believe Tom Parada went to a um, he went to a um, writing conference or some conference, and he he read from his first book, which was Election, and the book had not been sold yet, had not been published. And somebody that ended up making the film election heard him read and said, this is a great idea. They made the show, they made the movie, 
And then he got the book deal because the movie was being made, which is total, it's rare, but that's almost how it happens, needs to happen today. Yeah, I mean, I, look, man, I, I, I know what I've seen work. I know what will work. And I also know that neither one of those two things matter um, because sometimes something will come along and just catch catch fire and catch wind and it kind of breaks what the prior model was and makes people rethink things and then i also know there's always the x factor you just never know you never know what what's going to hit that's why some you know tv shows and movies people go oh that suck you just never know you never know you can follow the business model you can follow the plan the structure the you know, the three, three act, you can follow a, the, a different, you know, uh, storytelling structure. You just, man, you never know. And once something hits, that's the uh, aberration of what was the, what was the formula, yeah. um, then every, then that becomes the formula until people get sick of it. And it's really kind of like, it's kind of a, uh, it's backwards. It is a lot of fear. A lot a of lot. fear around, a lot, lot of fear around money. Yeah, I would agree. I would say that, yeah, fear is like fear. You know, I think it was Shakespeare quoted it first and Socrates, of course, mentioned it. And, you know, many other great writers of color that aren't mentioned often enough. Uh, Haile Selassie I'm, uh, said it, and I'm, uh, but fear and doubt, like the two biggest traitors to the human condition. Yeah, and yep. when is it art? Is it art for money? My favorite fear story is, has to do with John Belushi and it's from the book Wired. And it has to do with the band fear, but it has to do with how a movie was made. So when Belushi and Aykroyd made the movie, um, what, uh, made the movie uh, Neighbors, yes. which, which sort of crashed and burned because Belushi was so coked up. There was so much, yeah. according, to the, according to this book, not according to me. So Belushi, thinking that he had control and power, went into the studio, the movie studio, and he, did, and he was in this phase that he loved the punk band Fear, because Fear was just on Saturday Night Live. Oh, okay. And he was hanging out with them. Oh, okay. And he yeah. said, if Fear does not produce the soundtrack, it's not on the soundtrack of Neighbors, I'm walking off the film. Oh, no. And so they were kind of like, uh, John, no, uh, this is sort of a satire, dry comedy, and Fear is a screaming punk band. I don't know how that's going to work. So they finally appeased him. If you watch the movie Neighbors, if you can get through it, the closing Pretty credits, yeah. the closing credits has music over it by the band Fear. It does not fit, but that's. I was going to say that's probably where they put it in the closing credits. And it doesn't fit at all. So if you think you've got control, even if you're the star of the movie, guess yeah. what? You get the closing credits. Yeah, well, they had to appease him. Yeah, had to. Even if he's coked up, drunk, out of his mind, whatever else he's doing, you know, speedballing, which ultimately took his life. Yeah. I still, I was, I was so shocked when he died. Yeah. I'm wondering if he ever got help how far I don't know the guy. All I know is what I've, you know, stories I've heard from people who knew him well. I don't know. I don't know. It's pretty, it's, you know, it's so perfect. The whole Hollywood thing, Chateau Marmont, he dies doing a speedball, you know? Yeah. You, but, you know, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Natural talent can only go so far. And then, you know, piggyback to what we were talking about. There are other factors. A ton of other factors, yeah. A ton of other factors. The guy's wicked talented, but when you got eight hundred pound, two eight hundred pound gorillas on your back, you know, addiction and alcoholism, which I guess you could call the same thing, you know, it just makes it tough. It's lightning in a bottle, and it's you know, this could go either way. So uh, yeah. he had, yeah, he had enough. Yeah, the ironic thing was when I was drinking and using and quit. Uh, I you know I got help, but I couldn't write for six months because I doubted I could do it sober. I doubted that I could write sober. And I know, and I know so much better now that that was that's not the case. But you know, you, when you're 
when you're strung out or you just can't, you don't know how to live life. You've got no idea. I hear that said by so many recovering addicts and alcoholics. I didn't know how to live my life. I'm like, I don't, is that it though? Because I, I know a lot of people who aren't addicts and aren't alcoholics. And respectfully, I don't know that those people have any better handle on how to live life. Sure, I don't know. Here's the difference. Okay. Here's the difference. Every single activity had to involve a drink, even like out, your outdoor barbecuing. It, for me, that's how it was. Eventually. Okay, I see what you're saying. You're eventually. Use. Okay. And eventually your drinking affects those events. So not only you not know how to do it sober and, and, you, and you can't figure it out, you've already sort of messed up or ruined various events or right. out in them. So like when they say like, um, when you do get clean, you revert back to the age of your first drink. A lot of that is true because I, I was, you know, in my 40s and I got sober and I was still didn't know how to act much more than a 17 year old. Well, I mean, that's a whole thing. That's a whole thing. You're right. No, it's, it's, there's, there's, you know, you retard at that, at that age, whatever it is, you know, whether it's some kind of trauma, God forbid, sex trafficking, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, and you get sober and you get the drugs and the alcohol out of your system or whatever, you start dealing with the trauma and then you just kind of start to feel everything, right? I still retard to my immaturity as a 17 year old. Like, what am I, retarded? I'm retarded as a 17 year old, as they say. Yo, Timmy, Timmy, I'm wicked retarded. I'm wicked retarded. But that's, that's I think, you know, that that's such, we talked about this the last, so I don't want to go into the last right. part of being, but I think, uh, it's strange that that word is not allowed, except in Boston. For some reason, in Boston, people say it all the time. Because right? you say retarded, and asking. it's amazing. Yeah. But you know? I, I think I think in Boston, it's <clears throat> become this word that doesn't mean the person. If that makes sense, it's got. No, it's got I, a, it does. No, it makes sense, I mean, and and I don't want to belabor it, but it's. <sighs> There's, it, it's this oversensitization of worrying about offending everyone uh, or anyone. And although I am sensitive to that and I understand where it's coming from, it becomes a bit retarded. And you but start we focusing are also, on. We're also heading in the right direction, too. Uh, I, I Without watched question. The I watched the documentary on Attica and the. Uh, yeah behind that and the use of the n-word that was almost standard in terms of holding people in in this prison system and uh -huh. you know what I, i'm totally fine with that word not being used for any reason and and you don't hear it like you know, of course again i'm white but the instances that I would hear it from other white peers behind closed doors, it's, it's down to zero. And it used to happen fairly often. That's a good trend. I hope so. I hope you're right. You're right. Because it is behind closed doors that that kind of stuff happens. They don't want to ever really necessarily say it to people of color to their face. But and, and that's not easy. Retarded and the N-word are, are not equivalent. You know, it's a whole different thing. But um, yeah, this, that's why this becomes a big, longer conversation. But it is good that since we don't have a uh, drug-addicted, diaper-wearing, orange pancake makeup, bad wig, bad hair color, uh, plastic girdle-wearing white supremacist in the Oval Office spewing this nonsense, that it's kind of died back down. Uh, but it's still there. And so like, it's important that that gets addressed as opposed to just hearing the word. I think you'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I think he's, I think he's coming back. And unfortunately, I don't think, I think he's coming back, but there's gonna be a big push. It's gonna be hardcore, uh, but I don't think there's any way in hell that guy comes back. And he's created the model for being elected. So whether it's Taylor Green or whoever, whoever wants to run on that, they're gonna run on some of that rhetoric. Oh no, that 100%, yeah. 
I, we could, if we start talking about this, we'll go for 400 hours um, because I have, uh, yeah, I, I, I've studied this a lot more than a lot of people have. And I'm not a politician or, or political science strategist or anything else, but um, anyway, I, I think Donald Trump is going to be uh, slapped uh, very hardly in the face by the legal system very soon. Um, I hope that it happens sooner than later. But just not is, because of Donald Trump, because of the justice system needs to do it. We need to have justice. That why you can't why, get why does anyone pay attention to any law if this guy's going to run around and do what he's doing with no, no repercussions? So at some point, anyway. Tim, I'm going to cut this off. Uh, dude, always good to talk to you. I think we have to do version 3.0 sooner than later and you don't have to have a book to come and hang all right seriously I, I look, i'd like to be like the regular you know i'd like to be the oh, who used to appear all the time on did you say know. rug dealer no no i didn't say rug dealer I said, oh i thought you said rug dealer oh i like to be like the regular like the way um you know letterman had certain folks that showed up every couple months be hey, the regular you show up and sing like awesome. you did yeah, we had we had a technical issue, and unfortunately, I, I may I may blend both of them together. But he showed up singing, chewing gum, and he came in hot. And honest to God, that's all anyone ever wants is a, a lively guest who's not afraid to talk and uh, and be entertaining. And then the medication kicked in, and then, you know during this, I noticed this, there was a shift. Was that what happened during this version? To one of like. I think everyone should buy the best of Timothy Gage. It's 347 pages of wonderful material. Half, it was picked up by my publisher, and then I added new stuff. Hey, I'm really funny. I'm coming in hot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've said enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dar. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God.